A while back I made a short video about one of these power supplies, just basically saying that Avid sent me a picture that someone else had sent him and it showed that the whole plastic front of the power supply had gone far. So I immediately ordered one of the power supplies because that sort of stuff is interesting. Noticing this little metal insert that's loose, I didn't know about that. Uh, I'll try not to drop that in the live circuit board because it is live at the moment. And uh, before I start this, I want to show you a little quirk this power supply has. I've connected an LED to it, uh, using it on, uh, at the moment, initially called constant voltage, which uh, the current is not too high for this LED. But watch what happens when I start regulating the current down the current limiting. Do you hear it? And it goes really unstable. It flickers visibly. It's pulsing the current regulation. And I get a lot of noise from an inductor. I don't know if it's this uh, main output inductor or the switch mode uh, transformer that's uh, making that noise. So let's turn the power off again, noting that the circuitry in here is still live. So the first thing, uh, we'll take a look at the circuitry afterwards, but the first thing to note is that the leads that come with it are not really worth keeping. Uh, I'm just going to unplug this before I stick my hand in there. And I've tucked this over here. And we'll take a look at the lead because this is a lead that came for UK use and it's got the dreaded sleeved earth pin. Now the reason the pins are normally sleeved in these plugs is normally just the live and neutral pins and it's so that as you put the plug in you can't touch the pins until they're fully, you know, they, they don't make connection until they're fully inserted. The earth pin should be solid metal and I'll show you why. If we get a meter in on continuity and I measure from the earth connection in the socket to the earth in the plug, you get continuity. That's good. This is our classic plug uh, socket. And one of the things uh, that's notable is that the earth has to make connection first for safety. So the earth connection is right up the terminal, right up at the front here. So if I plug this in, it's making connection with the earth now. And I can demonstrate that, but the plug isn't fully in, so I can uh, basically just stuff the lead in here, stick it in the earth terminal, and you're getting continuity. But as soon as I push that plug in, whoop, as soon as I push it in, no earth con or continuity anymore. So though there is an earth in this cable, they've defeated it by sleeving that pin. So if you have uh, products that have bypassed quality control by coming directly from China via eBay, check if you're in the UK that you've not got one, anything with these plugs with the sleeved uh, earth pin. If you have, discard them and replace them. Next thing it falls down quite badly on is the test leads. Let's uh, pull the test leads off. And a few of you mentioned when I uh, put that video up in the first place that the leads it supplied with are pretty bad. And they are, they're very thin, but it's not just because they're thin. If you unscrew, uh, I'll just screw that bit back in. Uh, where's our screwdriver? There we go. If you unscrew the grub screw that holds the wire in position, it's just, it's not bared as, well, it is bared, but it's not bared and folded. It's, it's not even a thick conductor. It's a modest, it's not bad, but it's not great. But all they've done is they've stripped it, folded it over, and then gripped that with the screw. And that doesn't make a very good connection, and it's notable and I'll show you the thermal images of this, that this uh, connector, the, particularly the negative connector, was getting very hot because I did put this under a test. The original uh, picture was of a power supply that had been loaded up to 8 amps. So I put an 8 amp load on it. I used two 50-watt, uh, 12-volt halogen lamps, just connected in parallel across the output. Quite a high voltage drop across this lead. I just basically turned the voltage up until I got to the 8 amps I required and then I let it bake for a while. And the results were that everything inside the power supply was fine. But the negative lead here on the front of the power supply, where these are the leads plugged into the connectors on the front, it was at 43.4 degrees Celsius. And, you know, I suppose it's random how good a connection you're going to get. You know, it depends how, which way the strands ended up pointing in the factory. So that could have been a factor. Someone else mentioned that the connections on the back of the power supply that go onto that theirs were loose, and that could also have caused us a burning issue, particularly if that's a modestly high current. And you can see the heat transferring through. This is the front panel, this is the heat coming through from that hot connector coming on through the socket. But inside the unit itself is fine. The hottest component here 
was, let's uh, bring this round again now. The hottest component was this resistor down here, which I think is a uh, in line with the main transformer. I think it's a current sense transistor for the switch mode power supply circuitry for feedback. And uh, it was modestly warm. The components in this side were, you know, the transistors that drive, I'm guessing that these are the transistors that drive the switch mode uh, transformer. But uh, they weren't particularly hot. Let's see the temperatures. Uh, the resistor was at 82 degrees Celsius in an ambient temperature of 20. The hot components down here are supposed to get hot. They're the NTC thermistors down here. They're the inrush limiting thermistors. They limit the current in. Everything else was just acceptable. The transistors were about 46. The diode in the back uh, and the uh, MOSFET that's in the back was 40. And, you know, nothing really major. It seemed to be handling the power quite well. So let's take a look at the circuitry in this. I'll just pull this lead out completely now since I don't need to power this up for this. Probably a good thing because I'll be poking my fingers inside. So what do we have? We've got the mains coming in uh, and the earth goes straight onto the chassis here. And the chassis is used for earth continuity over to the front. We've got two blue class Y capacitors down here. Uh, which uh, connect from the live and neutral to the ground. We've got the two NTC inrush limit limiting uh, resistors. Basically, they start with a fairly high resistance that basically limits the inrush to charging these big capacitors. And then as they, uh, the current flows in, they heat up and their resistance uh, drops down lower till they reach a sort of equilibrium point. And it just takes the sharpness off the inrush. We've got a common mode suppression choke down here, which is uh, two opposing windings that counteract each other magnetically when there's common noise coming out the power supply. It doesn't really have much of an impeding effect on the sort of mains going in, uh, but it does have a, a limiting effect on the noise going back out again. We've got a little yellow capacitor down here, which is a X2 suppression capacitor. And then we've got a fairly chunky bridge rectifier. And we've got two 250 volt capacitors, which are most likely in series, well they will be in this supply, and I see some resistors down there which are probably balancing resistors 1003 100k um, then interestingly the there's another per complete power supply section we've got a bridge rectifier here, capacitor here and we've got a DK112, which is an interesting little switch mode chip that is associated with this transformer here. And it uh, is a quite an unusual chip because I printed something out, I've completely forgotten to bring it over. Uh, it's a very, very simple chip. It's got a very low component count. There's not even a bootstrap circuit. There's not even sort of feedback. I mean, there's uh, a little small capacitor for the uh, control circuitry, but it's really just to provide stable feedback through an opto-isolator down here. Um, and what's interesting about this is that instead of being MOSFET based, it's actually based on a standard unijunction transistor, like a typical silicon NPN style transistor, which is odd. Uh, but it seems a very popular chip, and uh, this transformer is not skimping. This is a big, chunky transformer for such a power supply. And this power supply is purely for powering the displays in the front and the feedback circuitry. And this chip here, which is a KA7500B switch mode power supply driver chip, and it appears to be driving through what may be an H bridge down here, this transformer here, which then probably drives the uh, MOSFETs on this side. So it's basically galvanically isolated from the main switching supply. Not sure why it would have to be galvanically. Oh yes, I do actually know why it would have to be galvanically isolated. Duh! Because that's all the output control circuitry. Yeah, that would be a really good idea, galvanically isolating that. We've got quite a lot of support components around here. Uh, and what says M324? I'm guessing that's kind of an LM324 quad op amp. We've got two little trimmers, which I'm guessing, uh, when you uh, adjust just the display in the front, you've got coarse and fine control over voltage, coarse and fine control over current. That's a reasonable enough way to do it. My first power supply did that. And uh, it means that you just get, uh, you typically you start off by getting the fine knob and you turn it to a roughly middle position. And then you tweak this to roughly the voltage you want, then you fine tune it with this one. It's a good system. And these knobs, uh, affect directly what the, the feedback from the switch mode power supply is doing. But um, the 
displays are basically just dumb displays. They're measuring the current uh, across a shunt and they're measuring the voltage across the output and you can just fine tune those, I'm guessing, with these two trimmers here. Noting that by sheer coincidence, and this, isn't this maintenance friendly? The two trimmers are right next to an exposed live mains connection. Keep that in mind if you ever have a wee poke around that area. Definitely a sharp screwdriver and with them with a plastic handle. Uh, and keep in mind that all the circuitry in this area should be class you should treat it as being uh, at mains voltage. Well, from here, this heat sink potentially, which I think it's, uh, the components are isolated from it, but, you know, just regard everything up that end. Just regard the whole thing as live. That's the best bet if you want to play safe. The switchboard power supply is coupling through this big transformer. And it all just looks really well built. I thought these were going to be two diodes. This one is a nice uh, off colour, a slightly translucent colour because I, I used, for the first time successfully, I used that heatsink compound trick uh, from EEV blog where you just wipe a bit of heatsink compound across because I can lead, read the laser engraving and it works really well. It really, just getting a dab of the white compound, rubbing it on and buffing it, fills all those uh, laser engraved slots and you can read it. So this uh, is a diode package, but this is a MOSFET. I'm not sure if the MOSFET might be part of the current limiting. I'm not sure if it's gating the switch mode power supply completely for that or it actually pulses, modulates the output, which is a possibility. It's just the way it sounded. It was a bit odd. We've got a bank of uh, capacitors, and maybe they're in parallel, perhaps, just to add up a decent value. This massive choke, which is not really glued down, it's cable tied down, and some more capacitors in the output. And fundamentally, that's it. The current sensing is done via a... You can't really see it. It's under this little... Uh, toroidal core. There's a little uh, wire loop there, just like a standard meter shunt, uh, just pocking up uh, and back down again to the circuit board. And it looks like a proper calibrated shunt. Then the front is just the display drivers, fundamentally. And all they're doing is just displaying what's set in these knobs uh, uh, by the current measured and the voltage measured. It's very simple. So the inside of the power supply is okay. It doesn't get too hot. It's got another hard quirk. If you set it at a low level, it just the fan just keeps just jittering, just backwards and forwards like it's just being pulsed. Um, so I've not given this a full... I've not given an isolation test. It would have been interesting to hear it completely to bits. I can't do that right now due to time constraints. But um, maybe in the future I'll tear this completely to bits. That would be quite interesting, get the circuit board out of it. But um, so far... Uh, it, it looks like it's built like a really good quality switch mode power supply uh, and it's let down badly by those really crappy leads. Oh, another thing about these leads, and this is another common thing with these. The crocodile clip end, as is so often the case, all they've done is cr fold the wire under it and crimp round it again, so again it's not a soldered connection. One of the first things I do when I get a set of leads like this is take that, open the crimp up, and solder those connections onto the crimp so it is a proper electrical connection. Likewise with this one, I'd strip this and uh, possibly upgrade the cable actually, or get a decent set of leads, uh, and then properly terminate it so that this screw was pinching onto twisted and folded cable so it really filled that terminal up. So that's my guess as to what happened. Um, I don't see, if it was a similar power supply to this, I don't see much really to go on fire here. The circuit board should be FR4. Sometimes when things go wrong, it can burn and smolder and track. But the most combustible bit has been this, well, the only really combustible bit is this front panel here. And it is very possible that uh, one of these connectors that just wasn't capable of taking that eight amps or something down, maybe the screw down here, just wasn't tight and it's uh, caused that problem whereby it's just are heated up to the point the plastic ignited. So if you've got one of these power supplies, uh, make sure your lead's good. Make sure you either solder these or change them out for better ones that you've opened up and checked out to see if they're good enough for you. Uh, but other than that, you know, it seems reasonable enough for a basic general purpose power supply. This is where being able to do a flash test would be quite interesting, this, to actually give it a real high voltage test. Other things worthy of note, they've got another, uh, I was going to say class Y capacitors, I don't know if they're class Y or not, but they're little blue capacitors, they've got them between the output and ground. That's partly for noise reduction, and partly it's going to protect this from, uh, if you connect this high-frequency plasma power supplies to it, 
with a lot of sort of high frequency, high voltage RF energy fed back from the power supply looking for a way to earth. Those little capacitors may actually provide it and limit the risk of, you know, uh, exceeding the voltage, uh, the insulation voltage of the transformer. So it looks, you know, it looks a chunky, robust, well-built power supply to all intents and purposes. Bit quirky with the current feedback. But um, other than that, for the price, it represents modest value for money. It, you know, it's a quite usable. But uh, just to upgrade your leads. Bonus extra footage, let's test the cable. So I'm going to lop the faulty plug off, the inherent design fault plug. Ooh, chopped quite easily the cable. I'm going to strip it and we'll do the flame test and see if it's copper or if it's uh, copper coated aluminium. And ascertain how thick it was. It's supposed to be 0.75, it says. Feels spongy. Oh. Okay, doesn't feel right. Hmm. Okay, let's do a flame test. This is a known cable, which is copper. Let's uh, zoom up. And we'll do the flame test. And what should happen if it's real copper is that as it heats up, it should sort of glow red hot, but it shouldn't malform in any way. So that's a pass. It's getting very hot. The cable's getting hot, but nothing's malforming. It goes sort of black and discolored. Let's try this one now. It's copper-coated aluminium. It's all just flopped. Okay, so uh, that cable's going in the bin. 